Part 2. Playing in co-op means that in theory, each player could specialize in a task. That is a very common thing that happens in cooperative survival games. For example, I took gunsmithing and Esbern did armorsmithing. It ended up being extremely inconvenient trying to coordinate what could and could not be done since you have to already possess the item to see how you can, or more likely can't, modify it. So we gave up on this division of labor early. It would be as simple as making it possible to browse mods for all items in an encyclopedia just to see everything that you've unlocked so far. Another example is one player doing lockpicking and the other hacking. However, the game heavily favors locks and does not seem to ever require hacking to accomplish anything meaningful. Uh, this is actually trash. Wow. I was seriously slighted in terms of contributions to the cooperative effort simply because my abilities as a hacker were useless compared to lockpicking. There doesn't seem to be content that requires intellectual coordination between players, only a handful of bosses that require multiple players in order to do enough DPS to complete the fight within the time limit. That is probably for two reasons. One is that there is no text chat, and two is that the game is designed to be playable effectively single player. I feel like a huge benefit of the game being multiplayer is that you could design some co-op dungeons around there being multiple players who can flip distant switches. Instead, the game doesn't feel like I'm playing in co-op. It feels like I'm playing in single player and I am getting live text updates about what other people are doing. The only real build synergy is to have one player doing high burst damage and the other doing high fire rate. The questing experience also doesn't assist with cooperative quest progression. In fact, the questing post Wastelanders pretty much forces you to do the content in single player anyways. What I mean is, there were a couple quests where the objective would be to push a button. A simple objective, but it didn't matter if both of us had the same quest at the same stage with the same objective and were in the same interior instance. If I pressed the button, it would not progress the other person's quest. For reference, Tez 3 mp the multiplayer Morrowind mod, with its default settings, will progress everyone's quest progress at the same time, whether they're present or not. Meaning that a multiplayer mod for a game that was never designed to be played in multiplayer has a more cohesive, cooperative questing experience than Fallout 76. Hell, Morrowind has more build synergy than Fallout 76, considering that in Morrowind you can actually play a support character and buff other players with spell functionality that came out in 2002 for a single player game. Stuff like this really contributes to the sense that we aren't playing a multiplayer game, but that there are just phantoms in our world that we might intersect with occasionally. It was very easy, especially early on, for us to lapse and not do the quest progress correctly. After a point I took over and made sure to keep private sessions aware of what he needed to do to progress. And that's the functionality of the main quest. The DLC quest lines are worse because they can't really be played in co-op. I mean they can, but the second player will need to do most things twice to make their own progression. Especially annoying since some in-game gear progression is tied to these quest lines. Literally one of the core selling points of the game being able to play Fallout with your friends, and they couldn't even do that correctly. Which makes one wonder why the game needed to be massively multiplayer. I spoke with someone who self-identified as a Fallout 4 fan and had played 60 more hours of 76 than I had, and they largely agreed with my general position that the game would have functioned better if it had been built around 4-player co-op. The only time the game being multiplayer worked in the slightest was during public events, and that was usually because those would be designed to require large amounts of single target damage, have a large number of enemies, or multiple objectives that were made easier with multiple contributors. Not that the average 76 player seemed to understand mechanics more complex than point and click, but it's not an MMO without NPCs pretending to be human players. 
It is interesting that some people argue the semantics about whether or not 76 is an MMO. I get the player count argument. These are 24 player lobbies, but there is obviously more to an MMO than just concurrent players in a server. Just because the Battlefield games have 64 player servers but are not considered MMOs doesn't mean the only genre indicator is player count. Ultimately, the confusing genre identity of Fallout 76 is representative of the game. It doesn't function as an MMO, there's not enough players. It doesn't function as a survival game, there's no challenge or permanence. You are one server hop away from safety at all times. It doesn't function as a co-op looter shooter. The only thing it seems to do is single player, but it gave up a lot of concessions that would have made that better in order to be a multiplayer game. There are a lot of potential identities that Fallout 76 could have, and it can even be multiple things at the same time, provided there is a strong vision that desires that to be the case. Nothing stops a lobby-based survival game from being cooperative. Nothing stops an MMO from having a story to tell. If there had been a strong creative push to make Fallout 76 a lobby-based co-op game, then it actually could have been really good. The mechanical gameplay already draws similar to Borderlands. Instead, someone seemed to have had the idea to make a pseudo-MMO game where players would fulfill the same mercantile roles as NPCs, and also a survival game, and then by merit of being multiplayer and having a friends list, the game was by definition also cooperative, even if it doesn't really function that way. Now, there are a number of changes to the game that were made over the years that gradually undermined various aspects. We already touched on the destruction of the player economy with the ammo change. Survival mechanics were also toned down. They used to be significantly more punitive. Anything more than nothing is significant after all. There is no limitation of resources to be farmed thanks to server hopping, nor particular need for players to fill the niche of being farmers or water barons. Overall, it should be clear that the problem with the game is a lack of well-defined multiplayer design vision, both in its initial execution but also in its post-launch life. Most of the gutting that happened to the MMO and survival elements happened post-launch. None of the three story-focused DLCs for the game prioritized multiplayer. For the 100 plus hours I have in this multiplayer game, I only have two stories to tell that involve strangers. The first was that Private Sessions had got a bounty from looting a safe that was within range of a player workshop. This was not a safe that was placed by a player, it was a safe that was located within the regular game environment that, because it fell within a zone owned by another player, resulted in the game giving him a bounty for looting it. Bounties in Fallout 76 are part of the PvP experience, which is basically just an old mechanic that gets used as a trap by griefers. Players with bounties are made viable targets of PvP, and most new players don't know that bounties even exist. Normally, pacifist mode is enabled by default for the reason that basically happened. A player walked up and instantly obliterated him in a single frame. If Fallout 76 is poorly balanced in the PvE department, you can imagine how bad it is at balancing a player versus player encounter. Most testimonials seem to indicate the end-game PvP scene to largely be players using mass-duplicated items, as well as heavy reliance on equipment that is no longer possible to acquire legitimately. Although, it was funny reading the Reddit speculations that, quote, PvP failed because Fallout players don't want PvP in their Fallout game, because Fallout games are single-player, end quote. Which just isn't true. That might speak to a certain antisocial mentality of single players, but that is painting a pretty broad stroke. Elder Scrolls Online has an active PvP scene, despite Battlespire being the only official multiplayer Tez game. I've also played the same 3D Fallout games that inspired this apparent pacifism. That doesn't mean I hate PvP, in fact I've actually played a lot of it in GTA Online. I wrote a post on this very topic on v board a couple months before Fallout 76 had come out, that for whatever reason I decided to screen cap. I don't know why I did that, but I'm glad I did because it ended up being useful. I was exactly spot on in my observation that Bethesda would have been better suited to making the game cooperative since their core design ethos was effectively incompatible with what was in the game. 
Bethesda was never going to commit to forcing their audience to actually compete, because competition requires a winner and a loser, and protagonists never lose. Remember, this post was both before the game had even come out and me making this channel, and I can say five years later that I was absolutely right. Fallout 13 was a Fallout conversion for the multiplayer game Space Station 13. Now, if you don't know what SS13 is, it's a multiplayer game that appears relatively simple but has a bottomless chasm of mechanical depth that is endlessly capable of producing interesting stories. A key to these stories, though, is inevitably the inconvenience, aka death, of other players. Fallout 13 was very similar, especially in that it had PvP. What's that? A Fallout game that had PvP in it? I was told Fallout fans hate PvP. Even further, by SS13 server standards, Fallout 13 was ridiculously popular. At least until an alien mod took over the PvP niche. After a while, it ended up being an ERP haven though. Turns out Fallout fans aren't just violent, but horny. And sometimes both. Actually, one glance at the Steam community tab for Fallout 4 told me as much. So, no, I don't buy that Fallout 76 PvP failed because Fallout fans hate war. Rather, what killed Fallout 76 PvP was precisely the same problem that killed the player economy, survival and co-op, a lack of vision. There are three main points to this I want to discuss, survival worlds, nuclear winter, and the current meta. Survival was a PvP gameplay mode that ran in beta between March and October of 2019, the year after release. It was originally stated to be getting a full release after Wastelanders as an alternative to adventure mode, but was cancelled as according to Ferret Badwan, the post-launch lead designer, the mode incurred a testing cost that caused Bethesda to shift their focus to other game modes instead. Accounts of survival mode seem to indicate that it had initially started very poorly, but over the course of its lifespan was turned into a more functional game mode. But it is difficult to tell because it's very possible that survival mode's number one fan has just revised the history of how good the mode was at the end. See, player versus player is particularly vulnerable to a lack of vision. People can muddle through garbage content solo, but if another player gets a leg up on you because of oversights on the parts of the developers, that can trigger a runaway reaction. Cheaters and griefers are drawn to poorly balanced systems. Their prevalence then discourages legitimate players seeking PvP from ever getting good, or to switch to PvE. PvE players see the prevalence of cheaters and griefers as validation, who then bill the game as having a PvE focus. And then you reach the modern point where PvP effectively doesn't exist. The current meta is to spam Stealth Boys and Nuka Quantums. This prevents VATS lock-ons and causes players to heal ridiculous amounts of HP per second. There is an upper cap on how much damage can be done which was added to stop one-shotting, so the goal of any fight is to try and overcome that limit, healing and whatever OP benefits their equipment is giving them. Trust me, however dumb that sounds is nothing compared to the explanations I've seen. A lot of it is reliant on duplication exploits to generate large numbers of consumable aid items and equipment that can no longer be acquired legitimately. As long as that continues to be the case, no new casual player is ever going to look at the state of PvP in the game and want to join in. Which brings us to Nuclear Winter. Now, Battle Royale is a meme, yes. Obviously making a BR mode in 2019 was cashing in on a trend. That said, the mode was popular and seemed to have had the most balanced form of PvP in the game, because it stripped players of their items. If there was any lesson that Bethesda could have learned from the two years that Nuclear Winter was in beta, it was that if you want to keep your player counts up, you need to actually update the mode and ban hackers. Also, that if PvP was ever going to work in adventure mode, there was going to need to be a serious conversation about ending the duplication market and removing overpowered legacy equipment, which they've taken the first step towards in a recent patch. Trying to balance the PvE aspect of the game, i.e. the health of enemies and the damage your weapons can do, and then factoring in the health of players as well, is a tricky bit of balance. It would take actual effort to accomplish, and I doubt that there would be much point, as most of the potential PvP crowd was likely chased off years ago and will not be coming back. So seizing old legacy equipment would probably just end up causing more controversy than it's worth. 
especially since Bethesda did make headlines after they banned a duper. The most recent updates from the past couple years seems to indicate that the game is basically in a holding pattern now, as most of its ambitious updates seem to have failed. That said, during writing, they did take the first steps towards doing this, so it's not impossible. To bring it all back, one of the only human interactions we ever had playing Fallout 76, and it was a relic of a PvP system that was horribly imbalanced. Trust me, this guy didn't need the tin caps. He just saw the opportunity to kill someone and took it. Which wouldn't be a problem if we were capable of ever defending ourselves. I've been in plenty of unbalanced scraps in GTA and both forms of Red Dead Online, and the key to emergent PvP in those games is that they don't have RPG number systems. The other interaction was two players who spammed orbital strike beacons to create an endless series of annoying explosions. But I guess there was a mod we were supposed to download to fix that. I'm pretty confident that I have demonstrated that the game is fairly antisocial, or at least it's the same level of social interaction as one might have with other humans while driving down a highway. Fallout 76 is not a game where you meet new friends, so much as a game you convince your existing friends to come play with you. Which, as I stated, isn't even that strong of a selling point for the game. After a physical exam and medical checkup, we head over to the fire station to sign up for the fire breathers. There is a pretty tenuous explanation for why. I mean, it's not out of place. Most side quests just seem to be us wandering into an area and feeling the need to complete almost completely random objectives. The worst one I saw was the player randomly feeling the need to blast music from the rooftops of a random town. The problem tends to be that the explanations for early parts of the main quest are located within the Overseer's audio logs, meaning that all it takes is a little bad luck and you might miss why exactly you're even doing something. Audio logs as the primary means of storytelling is not exactly a well-liked format, but I would say that Fallout 76 is doing it about as poorly as you can. Let's contrast this with Metal Gear Solid 5. Uh, sorry, I cannot resist my urge to mention that game. I'll make a video about it one day, don't worry. MGS5 is a game about espionage, so of course, pretty much every interaction that its characters engage in is getting recorded by somebody, likely everybody. Meaning that you don't have to physically show every scene of the story to the player, which is great for saving money on cutscenes. But it's also good because MGS5 is one of my favorite YouTube games. It's the right genre to be perfect to play while watching a video, and that's because its gameplay lends itself well to listening to an audio log while playing it. But, on top of that, the game does several things to make sure the experience of listening to audio logs is ideal. It lowers the game volume and provides subtitles so that the focus is on the audio log. Serving a lot of different appetites. Hamburgers. I, uh, hamburgers? Even we in there have become Americanized. Where are your friends? I eat them often back home. <laughs> and you just can't let them go. It has a built-in player so you know how much you've listened to and can stop it and replay should you get interrupted. Outer Worlds goes a step farther by providing full transcripts of the logs you've listened to if you decide that you would rather read them. MGS5 divides these logs into a clean interface making them easy to find. It tells you which logs you have and have not listened to already. They're also well produced so it's easy to understand who is talking and what is happening in a scene. Changing ships? We can't go sailing the Suez in a whaler. The Suez Canal. When did they reopen it? Not long after you were attacked. A good example in Fallout 76 of this being done wrong is in Huntersville. There is a log of a woman resisting a military arrest of her son, and as a result, she gets killed. I cannot specify how because there was a giant blank spot where the sound of the fight should have been. No gunshots, clubbing, or stabbing sounds. Not moving that child's wanted, so help me out. Ma'am, if you don't move aside right now, we'll move you ourselves. Do you understand? Why is this, what's with the awkward pauses in this? Put down the knife, Miss Sherman. I won't ask again. Oh, uh, <laughs> this sucks.
awkward pause. Hold it! Hold it! God! I hear I thought the, the military oh, was coming so and taking- So, what the fuck? They're not even gonna put gunshot sounds into this? <laughs> Private Zaleski. Go find the kid. Like, am I supposed to believe- There's not even, like, a sound of her getting killed. Like, even if they- I don't know, stabbed her or something. Like, what the f Why are you so lazy, Bethesda? You, you, you can't would think that they would have, like, just... Uh, just a know. gunshot? Uh, yeah. <laughs> Mind you, this is the area that is supposed to explain why super mutants are in the game. The audio is poorly produced, and the logs are poorly written. There is no audio mixing or persistent subtitles, so if anything noisy happens while listening to a log, you're going to miss details. There is no way of knowing when in the log you got interrupted, nor easily going back to the specific point that you missed. There is no care paid to any logs other than the overseer tapes, so it can be very easy to forget which log you just picked up and need to replay. Listening to audio logs while you loot or explore is not intuitive or easy, so as a result, the way to consume logs is to pick them up and then sit in a quiet place and listen to them fully. Or you can just listen to them on the fandom page. Honestly, it's easier than actually listening to them in the game. Who is it? U.S. Army, ma'am. Open up, please. What do you want? Just open the door, Sherman. <laughs> Who is it? U.S. Army, ma'am. Open up, please. What do you want? Just open the door, Miss Sherman. Imagine doing so poorly that fandom is the preferable alternative. Which is not a good integration of audio logs into an open world game, it's just a replacement for expository NPCs. Audio logs are something that could be a big benefit to telling this story. Unfortunately, they're all written in a Bethesda trademark way of easy post hoc explanations. Oh, oh hey terminals, I didn't see you there. As bad as the audio logs are, they are not as bad as the terminals. Peril on Gorgon was the first DLC for Outer Worlds, which surprised me by actually being really good. Honestly better than the base game. Which is normally what happens with DLC, Wastelanders, Steel Dawn, Steel Rain, Expeditions the Pit. One of the reasons for that was that I was invested in the audio logs and terminals. I literally read all of them. I cannot say the same for Fallout 76. I had been disappointed far too many times by opening a terminal only to find pointless information. For instance, while it is logical that a terminal under a massive bridge would contain Department of Transportation shipping weight records, you do not necessarily have to have that computer survive the apocalypse. There was another terminal I spent a couple minutes unlocking that didn't say anything. Yeah, I had that joke too. Oh my god, I'm glad I wasted all this time for 14 experience in a terminal that doesn't fucking say anything! <laughs> of course, the norm is that they would say things. Lots of things. Usually uninteresting. Usually five terminal entries from the six months preceding the apocalypse. I don't know if terminal sales picked up in West Virginia in 2077, but really there's a bigger problem. It is one thing to ask a player to read a thousand words, it's another to ask a player in a multiplayer game to read a thousand words. I came up with a pretty simple fix. The only problem with it is that it would take away the writer's ability to textually exposition dump about the setting so that lore YouTubers can actually prove that the world building was good. My solution is that the Vault 76 Pip-Boys would be specially equipped with prototype text-to-speech devices. They're advanced in that they can generate voices based on the writing styles, which is just an excuse to have voice actors. It would fit with the theme of automation in the game and would help with the idea that we are actually intended to be successful in our mission. Thing is, there is a lot of downtime in Fallout 76. Time spent looting, traveling, crafting, managing the inventory, etc. Actually, if combat is uptime, then like 90% of the game is downtime. So if you want to have patently verbose stuff, that would be the way to do it. But people are only going to listen to your audiobook narrations if they are interesting, which the environmental writing in Fallout 76 consistently is not. In one of the mines, the foreman excuses the introduction of new robot workers by unironically saying that the profits that management receives from this policy will trickle down to the workers. Like, literally. He uses the trickle down expression. Obviously, the writers are trying to make a point about workers falsely believing in the benevolence of the companies they work under. 
only they expose that they neither understand the politics nor the people they're portraying, nor how to appropriately discuss either. Trickle down, as an idea, is almost entirely contained within the realm of discourse. Even then, the term itself is used by people who are criticizing the policy, almost never by the people endorsing it. It would be one thing if the character was alluding to the general idea, but to have them say it flat out betrays that the writer has both a low opinion of the character, but also the reader. It wouldn't be obvious enough if the character believed in an obviously fallacious idea about his employer, but it's a broader issue in the setting. West Virginia is treated as an uneducated backwater largely because it, at present and for most of recent history, has been such. However, we're talking about an alternate American setting that is 54 years in the future. For 108 years, West Virginia has been incorporated into a broader commonwealth which should have resolved many of the local government issues and put the region at economic parity with Virginia, Ohio, and Maryland. However, being bougie urbanites, the writers see the diverse lifestyles and problems of the people of West Virginia today and ascribe a narrow-minded version of that to 2077 Appalachia. The people of West Virginia are treated as uneducated yokels, and the country themes are little more than this week's attraction at Bethesda Land. Never mind that in this alternate setting, serious money was poured into the region by the Enclave. Seriously, they had been planning for decades around having the automated silos here, and this is what caused the mass revitalization of industry. But the writer feels the need to treat the text box in the creation kit as their Twitter account. I absolutely wouldn't mind if this was a more thoughtful examination of the crab mentality that often holds poor rural folk back. There are plenty of interesting things Bethesda could do with a country-oriented Fallout game, since they've focused on urban and suburban environments in the past. However, as long as they have internalized the idea that country folk are the political enemy, they're always going to turn out a poor product. Seriously, this is the game that's going to suggest that the first raiders in Appalachia were wealthy tourists staying at a ski resort, and then simultaneously try to suggest that those people were actually just misunderstood misfits. Because at least one of the writers are those people. They see the apocalypse as the opportunity to kill those that they don't like, be it their home city, their city of origin, and in this case, country folk a day trip away from Maryland. But uh, yeah, I don't know why we're bothering with joining the fire breathers when I'm a level 3 hacker, and could probably just break into whatever database these people supposedly had that's going to help us out. The most tenuous part is that the Overseer leaves a log suggesting we do it, and then she went and did it, so she had the information, but she refused to make another log just telling us that Hank Madigan thinks there's something important at the top of the world. H hey, if the Overseer didn't have a camp, then does that mean she was lugging around all these stash boxes? Esbern and Delphine were elated at this news. They knew Parthenax must have had something to do with this top of the world place. We roleplay as fire breathers, heading into a mine full of Draugr, complete with audio logs of a squad of Wastelanders who joined the fire breathers for some reason and had died during the test. I get making the responders recruitment automatic, but in what world does it make sense to automate the fire breather recruitment? Especially with something this specific. We're not completing a test, this is a genuine den full of scorched that clearly kills people. What Wastelander looked at this as a legitimate option for... anything? Anyways, we head up to the top of the world. This is a ski resort up in Savage Divide, which I guess are the Appalachian Mountains. Is the implication that they shielded Appalachia from the fallout of bombs hitting Virginia, and so that's why it's so barren? For those who don't know, the Appalachian Range, while significant, aren't quite as tall as the Rocky Mountains or the Cascades, so the mountains are normally heavily forested. We arrive under the shadow of Top of the World when a voice speaks out to us from the PA system. This is our first hint at human life since we left the vault. Well, it's supposed to be anyways. If we hadn't encountered all those people involved with the Wayward, an untold number of random people that we shot, a woman who joined my camp to hang out and play guitar, and the multiple people hanging out at main quest locations up to this point, then yes, this would be the first moment that we have heard a human voice that did not come out of an audio log, which I think is supposed to excite us. At this point, we have been inoculated against the Scorch Plague, so we know that it generally operates like a disease. So somebody contacting us directly who may have isolated themselves and survived should theoretically be exciting, which Rose is going to need given the nature of her storyline. 
Just one more victim of wastelanders and its poisoned well water. Rose wants us to repair her signal tower so she can operate her radio again. We aren't directly told this will lead to us finding Hank Madigan, as this part of the story can be completed out of sequence. Technically, we're given the option to come up here if we come within the limited range of Rose's radio, but given the characterization, it would be easy to assume nobody would want to willingly expose themselves to this character until they realized they were forced to in order to complete the main quest. Now what's wrong? This barrel is well within regulations, okay? It's a fucking 32 inch barrel. <laughs> <laughs> and this is West Virginia. I'm sure you can get away with, uh... This shotgun should be legal pretty much anywhere. Even with the suppressor on it? Mm-hmm. You just need a tax stamp to get a suppressor. Really? We are now in the second leg of 76's main quest line, and it is very noticeable that the writing has shifted. For starters, instead of the quest being used to guide us to new areas within Savage Divide, we're given a task list that sees us retreading old ground to collect a bunch of quest items. In other words, a standard Bethesda quest. The completion of which is even necessary in order to do the Wastelander storyline for reasons that are incredibly stupid. Rose wants us to repair her radio station so that she can increase the range of her broadcasts, which she uses to recruit raiders. She is a robot who used to run with the raiders in Appalachia prior to everyone dying of the plague, hence why she has survived, and she's looking for some more entertainment. This has to be one of the more significantly stupid decisions we're currently being forced into making, and maybe you don't even realize the choice we should have been provided. If our goal is to rebuild America using Appalachia as the seat of New Virginia, then we've essentially been handed a clean slate. The fact that we aren't chucking pulse grenades at Rose and taking this position as a base of operations speaks to the sheer incompetence of the Vault 76 dwellers. In fact, I'm fairly confident in the assertion that every single moral evil that we see as a consequence of raiders on the East Coast in Fallout can be traced back to our inability to stop Rose from what she's doing. I just want to attack other people, and I want to kill other people, and I want to create conflict, and um, I want to watch the world burn. Rose is drawing more raiders to Appalachia, and as of Wastelanders, just a year later, she has succeeded in drawing at least three gangs to the area one of which being attack on site slavers. If we lock this situation down now, we could probably establish Appalachia as being a stable seat of power within 20 years. A century from now, our great-grandchildren could be living with similar security to pre-war life, but obviously we can't, because Fallout 3 and 4 have to happen. Further, Hank Madigan is dead. His corpse is being kept in a cage inside the room that Rose lives in. She says that she didn't put him there, but we know from later events that she is capable of doing some work on her tower, meaning that she could remove his corpse at any time. She has just chosen to keep it as is. She's keeping the corpse of a man who was in a faction of charity workers on display for fun, which is all the more reason to forcibly decommission her. Rose is an NPC which you can engage in dialogue with. She's just not human, so she doesn't quite cut it. Anyways, with her new radio power, she can call us up and give us field instructions on what to do next. Of all the responses to the prompt, tell a story without human characters, Rose has to be the laziest. She's a human character, she's just been given a robot chassis. But still, with the undercut and aposmatic hair color that this stereotype would have had, if the writers had been allowed to write her as a fleshy meat bag. I wasn't actually clear on why we needed to appease Rose's sensibility while playing the quest line, but there is something that Madigan wanted, which he claimed would be useful, that Rose is in possession of. And of course, it would be wrong to forcibly take it from her. So instead, we're going to learn about all five of the raider gangs that were in Appalachia. It is one thing to prevent the player from killing an NPC, it is another when the moral of the story the NPC is telling you is that killing people to take things from them is, in their opinion, a completely legitimate lifestyle. Like if Rose was doing this with the responders, yeah, it would probably be wrong to immediately jump to the conclusion that we should kill her, but we're literally doing a questline where we have to recreate the actions of raiders 
where we're not allowed to raid top of the world for the thing we want. The first leg is the cutthroats, where we have to modify a syringer and then shoot a Yao Guai with it. It'll be temporarily stronger and then weaker, making it theoretically easier to kill. Joke's on her though, Yao Guai aren't even dangerous in this game. Neither are death claws, but we aren't there yet. Then we recreate the trappers by building an IED and hunting with it, since at the time of this quest there weren't any settlers to go ambush with it. The diehards were a gang that tried to avoid killing, resulting in them being weak. This part is dumb, and the fact that Bethesda doubled down on it with Wastelanders is as well. There's already a lifestyle in the Wastelands for those who don't want to murder settlers. It's called being a settler. If you call yourself a raider and orient your society around stealing things from others, then you can expect to be treated like a scumbag who steals from other people. It doesn't matter if you steal someone's food but don't kill them, because you are still grievously injuring them. This is the part where we go up against the Deathclaw, by the way. It's amazing how much easier killing these things have gotten with time. Then you'll go be sent to get a weapon from a super mutant camp. Yeah, there are super mutants, we'll talk about that later, and yes, this is a Skyrim Radiant quest. Finally, we have to emulate the Gourmands, who of course were the cannibal gang. You just have to kill a feral ghoul, and the only notable detail about this part is that there's additional dialogue if you have the cannibal perk and actually go through with it. It is a minor acknowledgement, but that is still better than the literal radiant objective that we just did. From here, Rose wants us to complete a master key. The raiders all had fragments of a key that was used to access a hoard of treasure. I don't think there is actually an acknowledgement of what this has to do with Hank Madigan, so I guess we're just on a diversion to search for treasure. This involves another lengthy trek across Savage Divide. There's really not a flow to the order of objectives in the Raider questline. What I mean is, Top of the World should be at the bottom of Savage Divide, and each leg of the quest should send us further north, because after we complete this quest, we'll be entering the northwest part of the mire. You know, you use the quests to send players to all the locales of the area, and when we're done, have us primed to enter the next region. As is, there's a lot of back and forth across the map and fast traveling around. It's just not as elegantly done as the responder section was. Huh, weird. The part that has the NPC you talk to reverted back into being a standard dog Bethesda quest line. How interesting. It even features fast traveling back to Charleston to visit an area we have already been to. We do this as a personal favor to Rose looking for the body of a woman named Rosalyn. How weird. She actually uses this as a ploy to use our completed key fragments to steal everything from the treasure room from us. She didn't need the thing from her, uh, Rosalind's corpse. Basically, the raiders in Appalachia were led by a guy named David who was in love with a drug addict named Rosalind. They were busy doing raider things, fuck around, until one day Charleston decided it was time for them to find out the consequences. David got enraged at this as he was under the impression that they had killed Rosalind, so he destroyed the dam that was retaining the lake, destroying the city in the process, and inadvertently killing Rosalind. Afterwards, he ended up creating Rose before eventually succumbing to the Scorched Plague. Rose, being a facile replacement of the actual person, is pretty much the surface details of Rosalind. Rose isn't really concerned about it because Rosalind wouldn't have cared, so thankfully we're spared any kind of commentary. Rose has robbed the safe room, but for whatever reason she left the one thing we wanted, which was an uplink. It's broken, but Rose knows how we can go and get it fixed. Thankfully, it has nothing to do with her, and we close the book on an awful chapter of the game. It cannot be understated that the stretch between Charleston and here was one of the most awful parts of the base game experience. Our spirits were low throughout the entirety of Savage Divide. It was the perfect storm of exiting the honeymoon phase right into a terrible character with terrible quests, and it took a long time to do as well. The uplink was created by a faction based out of the mire, which interested Madigan as it has something to do with scorched detection. So if we want to make use of it, we'll need them to repair it. Only I don't know why we care, as our objective was to find leads on the missile silos. Ironically, we actually stumbled on the location of one of these silos when fighting that Yaogwai, and another when hunting for feral ghouls. Mind you, in both instances, they were coincidences, as the locations the quest selects to send you to are randomly chosen from a list of potential locations. But let's lean into that. We may have found the silo locations, but we currently can't get inside them. 
So Rose's quest should be rewritten to intentionally send us to all three silos, as the overseer tapes we find at the silos suggest that perhaps the survivors had found ways to fool the security systems to keep people out. This also unlocks them as fast travel points for later when we're going to come back. That would be the most useful part of doing the raider quests, actually. We arrive at Abby's bunker, she being the person who built the uplink, but obviously she's also dead. Abby's part of the story uses a series of pre-recorded messages which she has programmed to a number of conditionals that we unlock by completing her quests. In other words, they're audio logs, but we have to do what she wants to progress. I think it is a novel premise, and importantly, Abby doesn't make me want to die when I hear her talk. Abby represents a faction that lived in the mire called the Free States. They were doomsday preppers who had built their own bunkers in anticipation of the war. The weirdest part of the story is that the Free States seceded from the Union, almost entirely because they chafed the merchants in Harper's Ferry, which is strange. Like, the gun stores were supposed to be concerned with the amount of ammo the group was buying. Most gun store owners really won't care if you buy thousands of rounds from them. You would have to be bulking more than you would ever need to actually attract any kind of attention, at which point it would probably be far more economic to just start your own ammunition manufactory. They were also stocking up on medicine, food, water, etc., but I also feel like this really wouldn't have meant much if the free states just spread out or did bulk orders. Like, the feds got involved because free states people started getting into fights with patriots from Harper's Ferry who thought the free states were traitors and not just doomsday preppers, which would be a very normalized concept since Vault-Tec had existed for decades, being in the business of doomsday preparation. If anything, the feds would have gotten involved simply because the feds enjoy meddling and they have never historically needed a reason to do so. After we repair the uplink using equipment found in Abby's bunker, we are given instructions on how to go about repairing the scorched detection system that the Free States had come up with. Step one is to get the uplink, so if you haven't completed the raider questline as of yet, this is another way to go get to it. Like I said, the questline is freeform but still interconnected, which is relevant to the story. Our first step is to go to Rally Clay's bunker to get five fan motors. Rally Clay was the leader of the Free States. Then we need five heating coils. One is in Clay's bunker, another is in Ella Ames' bunker, one is at a relay tower, and two are back at Abby's bunker. I get why she didn't give us the instructions to grab these while we were here, because there was no guarantee until we completed the first objective that we wouldn't waste this resource. That is an in-character explanation. What I'm bothered about is that Bethesda has backtracked us up to Abby's bunker again. Because once we have all the components, then we need to travel down south, through the area, and install them into the detectors. I like the premise of this quest because it's sending us on an adventure through the mire. I just wish that we hadn't already explored half the area to get it. Unfortunately, it ends with instructions to go back to Top of the World to install the repaired communications uplink. Wow, I'm sure it was really worth being forced to see Rose again. Then it's back to Abby's bunker, again, in order to complete the final part of the Free States questline. First, we have to reach Rally's terminal in Harper's Ferry. There's a bit of a story here about how the town was responsible for the series of events that led to Rally's federal troubles. And he would have left them to die after the war, but his daughter convinced him to do the right thing. We upload a tape from Abby's bunker with the instructions needed to make the system work, but we need to access codes from a U.S. Senator, Sam Blackwell, who was friends with Raleigh and ended up joining the Free States. Surprisingly for a Bethesda plot, Blackwell is not a one-off story beat. His involvement in the story is important and will be called back to later. It's almost as though the story was written with layers and interconnected causal relationships instead of simply being a sequence of events. Whoa guys, watch out, the story is threatening to actually try to be good. We load the finished master holotape into a relay tower, return to the bunker, activate the scorch detection system, and complete the quest. Only problem, this doesn't actually mean anything. That is to say, it probably meant something in the original version of the ending, but Wastelanders retcons the resolution of the main quest in the Scorch to undo any kind of accomplishment in us stopping them. The only reason for doing the Free States quests post-Wastelanders is because you're following the sequence. If you wanted to complete the next phase of the questline early, you could do so and arrive at Camp Venture to begin it. While that hasn't been a limitation before, I think the connection here is tenuous. The responders led to the raiders through Madigan. The raiders led to the free states through the uplink. 
but nothing about the Free State seems necessary to complete the next leg of the quest line. Unfortunately, we have reached... I wish I didn't have to title this section Part 1, but we live in a world where there was not zero, but two content updates centered around the Brotherhood of Steel in Fallout 76. Now I want to be fair here, 76 is actually a pretty great opportunity for the Brotherhood. This is the earliest that we'll be getting to see the faction, meaning that we could be getting a look at the transformation from United States military units into a knightly order. Bethesda's handling of the Brotherhood was slightly controversial. There were a lot of question marks about why they even really needed to be in Fallout 3, short of the brand recognition factor of a person wearing power armor being on the cover. The Fallout 3 Brotherhood were far too good, being a departure from their original depiction. Then Fallout 4 course corrected, leading to the Brotherhood getting slapped with some extremist stickers. You can let me go and come talk to me in Crater. I deal with reasonable individuals, not an entourage of fascists with their guns pointed at my face. Personally, I would not have bothered including them in either story. They should have been treated as simply another in a long line of factions that come and go during the turmoils of the post-war wasteland. Actually, I probably wouldn't have even bothered with Fallout 3 and 4, so maybe I'm not the best person to ask. Still, it's all about brand recognition. You have to include the Brotherhood the same way you have to include vaults, caps, and quotes about how war never changes. We're first presented with a problem. One of the key audio logs necessary to understanding the foundation of the Brotherhood is located at Spruce Knob Lake, a location the main quest never takes us to. This log also incorrectly suggests that Roger Maxson is a traitor two months early. I mean, it's pretty key to understand that the Brotherhood of Steel was formed out of a stroke of total luck. Maxson stopped unethical experiments being performed by the US government, betraying his country, and the only reason he survived was because the bombs happened to drop a couple days later. Actually, that's the thing. This stretch of the storyline basically phones it in with telling the story by just using audio logs to get the job done. We've pretty much seen the extent of creativity with the prompt, so I hope you were impressed. Personally, I would have leveraged the Scorch Plague to tell this part of the story. Don't cure us back with the responders, and establish centrally that one of the first symptoms is hallucinations of what appears to be other people's memories. Plus, it would be better if the faction after the Brotherhood of Steel had the cure instead. The Scorched Plague is a hive mind, which is useful because it means that you could use memory sequences to portray these characters instead. Maybe we see flashes of important conversations and characters getting to contrast a functional Brotherhood with the currently decrepit bases that we see. I would establish that these events happened just 10 years after the war, when the Brotherhood had settled into using the new terminology, but before they've had time to internally codify it. The problem is, of the five factions in the game, the Brotherhood is the least I could tell you about without cheating and looking stuff up. The over-reliance on audio logs and their inherent design weakness in Fallout 76 meant that I did not retain much information about them. I know that they were a standalone military unit in the pre-war that was contacted by Maxon via a satellite. I don't know why they weren't deployed in China, but okay. Their leader, Taggarty, seemed convinced by Maxon's ideas that the old paradigms had obviously failed. They weren't all convinced though, because not everybody in the Appalachia Brotherhood had experienced what had happened at Mariposa. So there is some skepticism, but it doesn't seem to have really gone anywhere. Taggarty refused to recruit from the civilian population and the Brotherhood had access to anti-air missile weapons for combating Scorched Beasts. They were the most active in combating the threat, but they didn't have the responders inoculation, the Free State's detection system, and the Raiders... character? I don't know, the Raiders seem like kind of an anchor here. The Brotherhood has three quests, the first to explore Fort Defiance, the second to join the United States military, and the third to trek out into the middle of Cranberry Bog to discover the location of the main Scorched Beast Den. I guess Fort Defiance was an interesting dungeon? Joining the military was necessary because of the aforementioned fact that Taggarty refused to recruit civilians. To trick her automated system, we need a military ID card. That's actually characterization solely by objectives for both the US military and the Brotherhood. Good job. This quest was one of my favorites from the game, despite the on-the-nose writing. Unfortunately, this involves a trip back to Charleston to visit the Capitol building again in order to go to the DMV and get our ID made. 
So, the DMV sucks. I hope you like that commentary, because if you do this quest, you get to experience it for about 15 minutes. For those who aren't Americans, the DMV is a central part of our life due to just how ubiquitous car ownership is in the United States. Even if you don't own a vehicle, you still need to go to the DMV in most states to keep your ID card updated. So most Americans have stories about bad experiences at the DMV. Our bad experience at the Charleston DMV is pretty much entirely self-inflicted and you cannot avoid it. Half of the nonsense we do is because we entered the wrong line. You aren't allowed to enter line B until you do the sequence for line C. The problem is that most DMV stories tend to involve nonsensical complications that are not the fault of the person telling the story. It is a miracle that the exact robots we needed to complete this objective managed to miraculously survive the flooding of Charleston. The other problem is that this is a ghoul dungeon, which is relevant because Fort Defiance was also a ghoul dungeon. So it's intentionally tedious and repetitive. When Outer Worlds did this, it was because it was intentionally wasting the player's time as there was a murder happening during our absence. And even then, the service is still much faster. If you could just verify for me that you are Jolicoeur, comma, Celeste, or an officially authorized proxy? Yes, I can see by your eccentric mode of dress that you must be one of Ms. Jolicoeur's associates. So I guess privatization is the way to go. Like, part of the wait is for one of the robots to have a coffee break. Get it? Because at the DMV, sometimes time wasting is due to the employees taking breaks. Except those are understaffed government offices where they're the bare minimum number of employees. They don't take those breaks just to spite you, you know? Last joke is that we need a valid birth certificate, but we don't have one because we came from the vault. Alright, finally. We have our military ID card, now we can join the Brotherhood. I think Bethesda's trying to make a joke about how joining the US military was significantly easier than getting an ID from the DMV. I would have just cut the entire sequence though, because the joke was not worth it. This nonsense is entirely set up by the fact that the Brotherhood used military ID cards to screen their new recruits in the post-apocalypse. Like, the automated military recruitment camp was obviously a loophole that the Brotherhood probably didn't anticipate, and hell, I'd leave it at that. It's funny that we joined the military. But retreading Charleston yet again is the beginning of the end when it comes to the storytelling complementing the world design. There are still two regions we have barely explored and won't be visiting during the main quest. Cranberry Bog is the highest level area in the game, and we still have an entire faction to go. It should go without saying that I like the Brotherhood's final quest as it sees us touring through the bog. We get a real feel that the Brotherhood was very proactive about the problem, and even though they're gone, the information they managed to retrieve is still useful. The Glassed Cavern is also really cool. It actually feels like it's far from safe, even though at this point my character had actually been unkillable for several hours. We had discovered an event that spawns a lot of Scorched back in Morgantown, which ended up being useful as the holiday event increased the spawn rate of Legendary Scorched, which we nicknamed Santas. Oh god, it includes Santa, <laughs> Santa Scorched! <laughs> Stop, I'm over encumbered as it is. Anti-armor short double barrel shotgun, excuse me? I'm sorry, did we make a mistake playing this during the holiday event? <laughs> I think we did. Imagine if I didn't if I didn't decide to just come here to uh yeah. do the quest that I should have already had completed. Oh god, another Santa! Instigating oh god, he instigating dro short hunting rifle. Double damage if target is at full health. This and is, I can turn that into a sniper rifle. This is fucked, dude. <laughs> dude, dude, are, is, the, is our is this glitched right now? No, we have this an, can't be. <laughs> we have an event where it's spawning waves of fucking oh my. scorch, and the event is that <laughs> when there's like a random chance for scorch to be Santa, so we're just like we've what literally found out on? how to farm these things. <laughs> dude, I am so fucking over encumbered. <laughs> Holy crap, another 50% ignores 50% of your target's armor. Oh my dude, I'm getting I'm getting annihilated right now. Cause I I can't move. I'm over encumbered. Um alright, I'm gonna take some buff out. This this it's time for uh It's time for drugs. Yeah. I, I hear another one. Oh my dude, this is there's just way too much going on. There's another one. I got another uh power armor piece so when we get power armor uh i'm pretty much set 
They were like, yeah, this will be a fun little level 10 event where they fight five waves oh. of Scorched. And then oh. we walk away with like 10 fucking legendaries. <laughs> what the fuck? <laughs> <laughs> I am so over encumbered. I I'm almost double my equipment burden right now. Um, okay. All right. We have to recover. I gotta... Yeah. <laughs> I like that what we got from the money drop is significantly less worth oh, yeah. compared to what just happened. I can't believe this. It's And this is just a holiday event. Mm -hmm. That's all that was. But it just kept spawning them. Every wave had like one or two of them. Well, around the time I hit level 50, we did this event and I ended up getting my hands on a weapon that I could never really replace. Legendary effects are basically just enchantments and represent the core of in-game gear progression. Gear caps out at level 50, so past that, all you can try to do is get the best enchantments for slots, which can be difficult since it's effectively random. For most of the game, I'd been running the double-barreled shotgun since apparently games seemed to think that shotguns peaked there. I personally like double barrels in games since each shot is a risk-reward calculation. The most boring weapons, assault rifles, are unfortunately the meta just because they average out to being superior. The best part is that the Fallout 76 public servers are so laggy... You can actually consistently shoot it three times, which is big for a weapon whose core damage balance is supposed to be only being able to shoot it twice. Legendary effects work on stars. More stars means more effects. For most of the game, I had been using anti-armor effects, I would find, since that seemed to be the most overpowered one. But at level 50, I had a double barrel shotgun drop with just two stars. Vampires and Explosive. Pretty much no weapon in the game could top this, which was alarming since I had a hundred levels of progression ahead of me. Vampires is an effect which causes you to leech health when you do damage. It's very minor, unless you have it on a weapon that does a significant amount of damage. On the double barrel, it basically renders you invincible. So let's talk about the process of theoretically trying to replace this weapon, even though I couldn't. Legendary weapons can be acquired in one of three ways. Dropping from legendary creatures, purchased at a specific vendor, and crafted using resources from the same vendor. This vendor deals in a currency called Scrip rather than Caps. This is the first of many MMO currencies that we'll be seeing. You can get this Scrip by selling legendary items. Now this is all basically gambling. People are playing pretty much so that they can do a daily number of limited spins at their G-Roll. G-Roll stands for God Roll which is basically the best possible combination of effects on an item. Right now, the current max number of effects is 3 stars. It seems Bethesda was going to keep adding to the max number of stars up to 5 with more updates, but they realized just how insane that idea was. So if I want to roll more double barrels, then I should buy those crafting resources and make my own legendaries, right? Well, if you notice, the crafted double barrel legendaries do 20% less damage than the natural legendary that was dropped. I thought this might have been a fluke due to the explosive effect, but I was able to replicate that difference with other weapons as well. Crafting legendaries might give you the weapon type that you want, but if you want the absolute best, it has to drop naturally. This is where the game having a larger weapon pool than Fallout 4 suddenly turns into a problem. The more weapons there are, the less likely you are to get the type that you want. Armor can also drop from the same pool, and you can even make it bigger through unlocking various new items. For instance, getting the power armor station results in you also unlocking Excavator Power Armor, which adds 6 items to the pool of potential legendaries. Now, you could buy from a specific category if you want, but remember the currency. Scrip is a limited daily resource. On most days, you can only get 300 Scrip from selling legendaries. This was a very easy limit to hit once we reached the endgame. 3 star weapon rolls are 100 script per, the only mercy is that melee weapons are a separate category. This merchant was added in the first content update, when there really wasn't an end game yet. If you consider just the low probability of getting the effect combination you want, and then multiply that against the sheer number of possible items that you could receive, the end result is that players could spend thousands of hours doing daily gambles for their g-roll and never receive it. Of course, you don't have to do any of that. I'm just explaining what the in-game is for people with quadruple and quintuple digit levels. The Vampire Shotgun was a 2-star and easily beat out the anti-armor and vats crits shotguns I had made. 
You're going to see just how absurd this thing is, don't worry. Anyways, what's important about the glass cavern is not just the presence of the Scorched Beast, but the revelation that they had been using atomic weapons to do underground mining in this area, which has understandably created problems for the region. Upon realizing that the Brotherhood could not deal with the Scorched conventionally, they had considered a plan that some might consider slightly radical, which was the deployment of nuke weapons. In fairness, the Scorched Plague is basically an existential threat to life on Earth. One of the revelations from Cranberry Bog is that it doesn't just affect humans. A lot of creature types also have Scorched variants. We are on the Virginia side of the Appalachian Mountains, so we're going to have to do something if we don't want to see Scorched in Fallout 3. The Brotherhood's inherent problem is that they think they're the only ones capable of dealing with any issue which exists in the wasteland. Still, they acknowledge that if there's any lead in West Virginia about how to gain access to the nukes, it's gotta be the Free State's own Senator Blackwell. But step one is gonna be locating him. It is entirely possible for you to have found his bunker already, even though it's not signposted on the map. But if you haven't, then congratulations. We're going back to Charleston. Again. You know, there's not even that much interesting stuff there, considering literally every major building gets used as part of a quest. Blackwell did an interview with the Charleston Herald, and the journalist kept detailed notes on the route she took to reach Blackwell's bunker. Turns out once we get there, this information was used by a federal agent as well. Moral of the story, do not talk to journalists. They are a portal to the feds. I would say that Bethesda was accidentally based if they didn't put a glowing mushroom above the agent's corpse. They even made another fed a glowing one in the DLC. And that doesn't scratch the surface of political takes that are coming. So the fed recorded instructions on how to get access to what we're looking for before getting killed by death claws. Work for the Scaled Ones, die by the Scaled Ones. It's really convenient that everybody that has ever been killed after recording an audio log at least had the courtesy to stop the recording before it happened. Do you think Deathclaws are like alligators which kill their prey before eating, or more like bears which will just start eating you without much consideration for your feelings? Blackwell's bunker is largely filled with written notes. The Free State's people seem to be particularly tragic, since they died slowly and alone. Blackwell was a popular senator due to being pro-union and was, as mentioned previously, friends with Raleigh Clay, leading to him being a member of the Free States. But the feds didn't end up catching up with him until after the war when they wanted him dead due to him still having his keycard to the congressional bunker. No, seriously. I think this is a fitting uh, soundtrack. The issue is that he didn't turn in his key card, because I guess it would be really inconvenient to have to make new cards for everybody. With a key card and a welcome holotape in hand, our next step is to visit the bunker at White Springs. This is one of my issues with the world building of 76. The excuse is made that West Virginia didn't get hit with very many nukes as there wouldn't be much point, due to a lack of targets. But I did mention the three automated nuclear silos and now a bunker full of the United States federal government, didn't I? For reference, 77 warheads targeted Las Vegas, a city in the desert. The only place that would be more wasteful to nuke in a total annihilation situation would be Phoenix. Someone did the math using population numbers, including the figure of 400 million living in America by 2077, and assumed equal growth in targeting and determined that one warhead was deployed for every 10,000 citizens, and that annihilation could be accomplished with less than 5,000 warheads which is pretty close to the present American stockpile, and nothing on our peak stockpile from 1967. So you could easily assume at least your local state capital is going to get hit. Thing is, the Chinese had operatives in West Virginia. They knew about White Springs and likely knew about the automated silos as well. Now oh well. Entering White Springs, we find ourselves being greeted by an artificial intelligence. Like so many things in West Virginia, there's a level of automation to White Springs. It's well defended and maintained given the 25 years of apocalypse do not seem to have phased this area in the slightest. Now of course this is cheating similar to Rose, it's only really different in the sense that Modus is a terminal rather than a robot, but this is sidestepping the no humans rule by just having non-human characters. But uh, noticeably the congressional bunker is absent of congressmen. Display your utility to us and perhaps we'll allow you to join our little enclave and allow you access to all this place I is really capable don't want to of join another 
faction that doesn't exist anymore. If you believe you might suit done this like needs, four times already for the love of fuck down the stairs. Or if you get to the part where you guys were all wiped out because we can't have human people this in this terminal. fucking uh, story. And do help yourself to some refreshments along the way. You must be famished. Oh, how things would change. Surprisingly, the story of the bunker isn't about how Modus killed everyone here, and he really wishes you wouldn't assume things just because of stereotypes about AI in the media. Okay, he, in fairness, he did kill everybody, but in self-defense. The Enclave living in the bunker suffered a division in ranks that resulted in a civil war, and one of the actions involved the destruction of some of Modus's memory banks to prevent that information from being recoverable. This was, understandably, something Modus took issue with. He killed everyone because the people who attacked him were also the survivors of the Civil War, and they tried to mentally disable him. Only problems, we're getting all this through more holotapes and more terminals. I wish Modus would just say, yeah, I did kill everybody here, after they attacked me. What are you gonna do about it? Cry? <laughs> There is information here that ties the entire story together. For instance, the Chinese robots, Super Mutants, and Scorch were all things that got released onto West Virginia by the Enclave. But they didn't just do this because they're evil and thought it would be fun. They wanted to use the automated nuclear missile silos to attack China again, but the DEFCON rating was too low. So they introduced these elements in the hopes that it would increase the rating. Some of the Enclave members didn't think a second wave of retaliation against China justified the damage they were doing locally, damage that we just spent the entire main questline witnessing the consequences of. The responders were wiped out because they were separated from the Free States and Brotherhood of Steel by the Raiders, so they couldn't distribute the inoculation they discovered soon enough. The Raiders, being selfish, didn't think that anybody else was capable of being selfless, and they didn't bother installing the Free States uplink that would have made the detection system regional. The Free States had a Scorch detection system, but the Brotherhood didn't trust civilians to do the job correctly. The Brotherhood had the best weapons, but they couldn't sustain an entire conflict by themselves. And the Enclave were responsible for everything that had gone wrong. Instead of using the immense resources and organization they had access to in order to rebuild America, the Enclave doomed everyone out of a selfish desire for revenge. They would not have accomplished anything meaningful, but they tried it anyways. Fallout consistently pitches the idea that success in the wasteland can never be found by trying to recreate the pre-war society. The most interesting visual details at Whitespring are that the bunker uses vault assets, in case players still haven't figured out the connection between the Enclave and vault Tech. The other detail is that Modus is visibly damaged. Some of the lights in his memory banks are out or red, which obviously visually signals that Modus is not operating at his full capacity. Neat stuff. I just wish I didn't have to dive into terminals and listen to holotapes to hear a story I really only need the surface details of. In order for us to join the Enclave, Modus has a task in mind. I would complain, but his tasks are logical and take us to new and interesting places. Our first target being Sugar Grove, which is an actual NSA facility. They were monitoring pro-union and anti-automation causes, investigating Chinese investments, and keeping an eye on the free states. In other words, pretty typical domestic federal agent stuff. They also have tapes on various cryptid sightings, including Grafton monsters, Snallygasters, and Wendigos. It's interesting that they would confirm this stuff is existing in the pre-war. Modus just wants to be hooked up via an uplink to Sigint. With an uplink in hand, we take it over to an astronomy center and connect Modus to an orbital platform. The platform was intended for Modus to be able to monitor Appalachia, but he lost connection during the Enclave insurrection and now it's slowly falling out of orbit. Having regained his connection, he sees what is very obviously the scorched problem. Now, if Modus was just an evil AI bent on creating a silicon utopia, he'd use his new orbital missile platform to kill us here and now. He doesn't seem at all interested in the silos. Pretty much his entire characterization is just about restoring his lost functionality. In order to gain access to the silos, we need to become a general of the United States military. Luckily, we already have joined and have an ID card. I think it's interesting that you can do that out of sequence and the game has contingencies to acknowledge it. We need to get 10 service commendations, which is a fairly freeform objective. You can do this by either killing legendary enemies and or scorched beasts, or completing events for Modus. This ended up being extremely easy for us due to the holiday scorched event, and in no time we had risen up to the ranks of general. Now we have access to the silos, but there are a couple things we need. 
First, we need a nuclear keycard. This will require tracking down a cargo bot flying around Appalachia, which can be immensely difficult for certain short-range builds to deal with. Or we could just get five free keycards from the Battle Pass. Fallout 76 calls its Battle Pass the scoreboard, but it really is just a generic Battle Pass. I suppose if you're like me, it's entirely possible that you missed the experience of what Battle Passes are like, or the general lowering of quality that they seem to bring to games. Battle Passes are experience systems that you earn levels in via in-game challenges to unlock various rewards. As a monetization scheme, you can buy your way through a Battle Pass straight to whatever awards you want, otherwise you have to complete the challenges before the season ends. However, challenges can often fall outside the norms of what you would typically do in a game, resulting in grinding and thus a desire to spend money to solve the problem because of FOMO. Battle passes also have the negative effect of encouraging players to play in particular ways or modes that they otherwise wouldn't, which almost always has a negative impact on games. That, however, is really a bigger problem for battle passes in competitive games. 76 did experience this with Nuclear Winter though, as players who wanted awards from the mode but didn't want to play it would just hide in bushes instead to earn progress. We've got 10 nuclear keycards between us, thanks to completing a handful of random objectives up to this point. We also need the codes, which are encrypted and changed weekly, but <laughs> they're online. Yeah, so the silos are per server and have cooldowns, meaning that there could easily be a system where each silo on each server has a unique code. But instead, there's a code for each silo, it changes weekly, and can easily be found online. I mean, the encryption seems pretty neat. I'm sure it's fun to do the first time. I'm sure if you're an encryption nerd, you'd probably love it. All that's left is the silo itself. The Enclave is the best faction in the game. We were always working for them, and have now simply formalized our relationship. We have been given status, power, access to items, drip, and weapons of immense strength. All that, and without conditions. We weren't expected to do anything tedious, we weren't annoyed by poor writing, and the deal we made was more than fair. Yeah, Vault 76 turning into the new Virginia Enclave is pretty much the only viable option. Which makes it all the more hilarious that it will inevitably get lampshaded by the DLC. You joined up with that Modus guy, huh? He contacted us when we started poking around here. Thompson, what did you say he reminded you of? I said he reminded me of the Galaxy News radio announcer, but, like, obviously evil, sir. We cap off the Enclave questline with one of the best dungeons in the game, the nuclear missile silos. This was the only challenging part of the game. However, it turns out this was mostly due to us doing it on a private server. Pay picky problems, am I right? At this point in the playthrough, we had basically given up on public lobbies. There was effectively no upside, because we never encountered other players doing quests and our performance was noticeably worse. So we journeyed privately, which is not the intention of this quest. It's ironic, really. When the game recommends 8 plus players for the final boss, it means it. But if you do the missile silo in a public server, you get a much worse experience. I am not joking when I say that we manage to repeatedly crash private servers because of how much happens in the missile silos. But it felt perfect. Us breaching this facility is extremely dangerous, so the security is appropriate. We were literally fighting room after room against an obscene number of robots. Private sessions had to retreat at one point. I had to find crafting stations just to make more ammo and repair my equipment. Even the trusty vampire shotgun was pushed to its limit. In a public server, the silos are cakewalks. There's less enemies, sometimes there weren't even turrets. In a private server, there are so many turrets that using the terminal to force them to target robots would crash the server. It is also interesting, not in a there are terminals that make good fodder for lore videos interesting, actually interesting. The first area requires us to create a biometric keycard, then we have to resolve a reactor shutdown, then we have to destroy the mainframe to gain further access, then we have to repair the mainframe, and finally there's a defense sequence where we have to defend robotic officers from the security forces in order to finally gain access to the missile. Our first missile silo was probably the best hour of Fallout 76 I experienced followed by the crushing realization that we were mathematically incapable of beating the final boss. No matter how high we go, 76 strives to return us to the norm of mediocrity. Fallout 76's main quest is completed when we launch the missile, and does not require defeating the Scorched Beast Queen, but it is a bit of a climactic letdown, to say the least. 
Bethesda seems either uninterested or incapable of utilizing health scaling tied to the number of players involved in an encounter. It's certainly possible with builds we later found, just not in a way that the main quest had prepared us for. As a result, it doesn't really serve as a satisfying final encounter. The Scorched Beast Queen should be testing ideas we've been forced to experiment with throughout the game. Perhaps it did at one time and had simply been diminished as patches gradually sanded down all the rough edges. In order to defeat Parthenax, we have to go to a public server and just wait for someone to do the event. We didn't know yet that the public silos were easy and we weren't prepared to do another tough one so soon. This marks the transition towards us playing public events in the end game as well as going through the DLC. So let's finish talking about the main quest. Wow, what a disaster. You have to imagine that if I think it's better than Fallout 3 and 4 as well as the story DLC for this game that I don't have very high opinions of that. And that would be correct. I tend to have a weakness for experimental games, and this was definitely Bethesda experimenting. It's the easy way out to simply say that they were cynical and cashing in on trends. I don't think many on the team felt that way about their project, but I would agree that it was mismanaged. Fallout 76 represents the point at which the trend of games being increasingly broken was eventually pushed back against at launch. People always complained. But before Fallout 4, that message would only gain ground after the honeymoon period ended. Hopefully, it was a wake-up call for Starfield. This was part two of a four-part edit of my Fallout 76 video. If you want to see the uncensored cut early, check out my or Private Sessions membership platforms. Esbert, I'm glad you're finally wearing your Blades armor. Not just wearing clothes around Cloud Ruler Temple all day. Why does Delphi wear the armor? She doesn't do anything. She really <laughs> is a weeaboo. <laughs> I mean, I guess Joffrey just hung out in the temple. Well, jo no, Joffrey gets in a few scrapes. Yeah, he he goes to the uh, to the battle at the end and shit, or the battle at the. Uh... And I guess like they're they're actively thinking that the temple's going to get attacked. Delphi never goes, hey, we're worried the Thalmor might find this place. Nah, it's too fucking... Too high IQ for, for the Thalmor to figure out. Actually, that's probably correct. I mean, the Thalmor in Skyrim, 